Hello, we are going to start now the fifth module of our ESA NFIP integration training series. Um, this module will focus on ordinance updates to make life easier, developing an NFIP ESA compliance strategy. So in the previous module, we talked about habitat assessments and the kind of analysis that that need to be part of uh, applications and your review of that analysis being essential to making permitting decisions to make sure that any floodplain development that you're allowing to occur in your special flood hazard area um, is compliant with the ESA requirements in the biological opinion for Puget Sound. So we're going to start going into what kind of tools communities can develop to help them meet these requirements more easily. So I'm going to start this conversation which I, with what I think is a totally reasonable, worthy question. Do we really have to do this, right? Do Puget Sound communities really have to do meet all these extra higher standards? And some things to back that up of, you know, hmm, is this really required? It's, there's currently no regulatory biop language that communities must adopt. There's nothing that we're telling you you must adopt in order to, um, you know, to be compliant. Uh, and the reason for that is that the Code of Federal Regulations, which is what establishes the NFIP's jurisdiction and those minimum requirements that communities uh, adopt when they become members of the program, that applies nationally, right? And so far, the biops that um, that Aaron mentioned in an earlier uh, module that you know both apply to our region and to a few other regions, those have all been regional, right? So they have not changed yet the CFR to reflect these additional requirements. So a reasonable question might be, well, then how can FEMA require Puget Sound communities to comply? You know, shouldn't FEMA have to change CFR before they require, you know, us to do more than our neighbor communities that aren't covered by this biop? And is a community's NFIP status really dependent on compliance with these requirements? All reasonable questions. So let me give you my answer. So. As was mentioned in an earlier module, the NFIP is not a mandatory regulatory program, right? So community participation is voluntary and FEMA doesn't issue permits. We don't we don't issue floodplain development permits or and we don't have land use authority. And so, you know, when a, a, an applicant or a developer, let's say they come directly to me and, you know, to ask what the NFIP or FEMA requirements are, um, I'm going to make it really clear that the authority and responsibility to answer their questions is their local community. I may, um, you know, I'll talk to them about what the minimums are that that the CFR requires, and, and I might discuss a little bit the advice or the support that I would provide to the community when they make that decision, but that is not my decision. Um, we operate entirely through local authorities, so when a community joins the program and adopts um, a floodplain management ordinance that includes those NFIP minimums, they are, it's through their authority and their, um, their, their laws that the NFIP operates. Well, again, I mean, that doesn't answer the question of why does FEMA get to make us do this, right? If it's local authority and if the CFR is only limited to the minimums, good questions. But where our authority does lie is enforcing the NFIP membership standards. We get to decide and we are tasked with deciding what communities can effectively manage floodplain development in a way that, you know, that qualifies them for, for further participation in the NFIP. So that's, we are kind of the, the gatekeepers in that sense. And so failing to meet the standards of the NFIP, whether they be the minimums in CFR or they be, you know, standards that have been developed at a regional or state level, those things can result in probation and suspension from the NFIP. And um, refusing to evolve your floodplain management programs such that those activities are no longer jeopardizing species in critical habitat areas is a reasonable reason, you know, to, to, uh, to make us feel like you're not meeting those standards. And then from another perspective, you know, the, the, if you read the biological opinion, it's written to FEMA. It's addressed to us as the federal agency um, from the services. And so it says, FEMA, thou shalt not allow floodplain management to continue in, in Puget Sound the way it has been, or you are violating your responsibility as a federal agency to follow the Endangered Species Act. So we can only allow members to stay in the NFIP whose activities are not only not going to jeopardize species, but aren't going to put us in further violation of the ESA. So that's how I arrive at that. But 
another way of looking at it is that we have a biological opinion specific to our community, specific to, bio, to the Puget Sound, and it's talking specifically about our local species that are threatened with extinction, that are really in terrible trouble. And so, you know, I guess my other response to do we really have to do this, I would say, well, are we really going to let this happen in our house, right? Especially when you can look at the biop, you know, as a whole bunch of uh, new standards and new work we have to do. But another way to look at the biop is the services, NIMPS in this case, has taken the time to look at all of our activities. What do we do? What's floodplain management in the Puget Sound look like? And they've evaluated all these things we've done, and they've come up with what can be seen as a kind of user manual that says, okay, what you've been doing up to this point has been making things worse for these species for these reasons. So here is a way that you can go about it that we are confident will make it so you are no longer a, you know, a, a, a primary actor in, in, in making things worse for these species. So we have a pathway forward. We have a description of how we can continue to do our work in floodplain management in a way that we can be confident is not going to make things worse, right? So that's, that's a positive way to look at it. And, um, from what you learned in the earlier module about the other biops that have, you know, that, that have come out from other regions. I mean, in a lot of ways, the horse is out of the barn a little bit on how floodplain management affects species. And so there are other potential defendants. There are other areas that are in some, you know, jeopardy in terms of whether or not what they're doing is making things worse. We've kind of gotten ahead of the, you know, a crowd in this and that we've had that evaluation. We know what we need to do. And it's just a matter of figuring out how we can do it. Okay, so on this slide, I want you to think of two different communities. One community is going to be described in the gray box, and the other community is going to be described in the green box. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, community A has no adopted biop language in their ordinance. They have no updated permit application that outlines the biop requirements. They have no standardized process of reviewing habitat assessments. They have no staff training or department coordination that they've come up with for, you know, for educating on the biop requirements. And because of all these things, there hasn't been any involvement, commitment, or even awareness maybe of leadership or elected officials about the biop requirements um, in floodplain management. So that's community A. Let's describe community B. Community B has community specific biop language in their ordinances that outline the requirements. They have a permit application that includes detailed habitat instructions. That means that when an applicant is filling out their, their floodplain permit application, there are questions on there about habitat that they answer right there. So that, that makes it all the more likely that when the application finally gets to Community B's permitters, it's a lot, it's going to have a lot more information. Um, they have established, established standard process for habitat review. They've worked out how they're going to do it and they've applied it to all of their permits. They have an SOP and training for new staff and other departments. Their leadership is aware of the requirements because, you know, the process of going about adopting new regulations, of cracking open ordinances and, you know, adding new stuff, that is a process of public hearing. It's a process of public awareness. And so they have leadership and they have a community, property owners and developers that are familiar with these requirements. So imagining these two different communities, right? what compliance standard from an ESA perspective applies to either one of them? And the answer to that is that it's equal. And so my, my whole point in this module to say is that whether you're in a community that has not developed any of the tools to meet these requirements, right, because we don't have any biop required language, we have lots of suggestions and recommendations that I'm going to go to next, but a community that hasn't done anything in ordinance or process to, you know, to incorporate these requirements into how they do things versus a community that has extensive tools, both in ordinance and code and in process to help them do it. Those two communities have to meet the same level of compliance, right? You have to meet the same level of ESA, um, you know, requirements, regardless of the tools that you've developed. When we think about local planning, we think about, you know, floodplain management, it's really got two parts. We've got the obvious part, which is code the adopted regulations that outline rule, the rules and how they will be administered and enforced. What's in your books? What's in your municipal code? But just as important is process. How do these uh, regulations and code, how do they translate into daily real world actions? And that includes, you know, the, the permit application forms that you have people fill out, your intake process, routing of applications, review, approval, inspection of development. How are you enforcing it? What's your compliance, documentation, record keeping, all of these actions that aren't 
may be outlined specifically in code, but are essential to making that code, you know, to, to administering and for enforcing it. If you only have code, if you've only adopted the words and the language, but you have not come up with a process in order to put that into action and, and bring it to life, then, you know, that's not going to work. You're missing a, a massive part of how this how 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 this operates. So FEMA came up with a um, with a series of compliance strategies. We call them the doors, and these are three different routes to the same destination, to that ESA compliance that's required equally of all NFIP communities. And these strategies are defined by being by different levels of ordinance adoption. Um, so that's how each one that's that's the scale we're on. How much language has the community adopted? How much have they baked these requirements into their floodplain management program? So let's start with door one. Door one refers to the NFIP ESA model ordinance that the region has developed. So here is a standalone loan model ordinance that you can adopt as a biop community that includes lots of different languages that can help you do this. So it was developed at the region with the help of a lot of communities with diverse stakeholders, NIMS was involved. Um, and this document combines the following. The floodplain management includes the floodplain management minimums that are in CFR, along with any regional recommendations. So it, got, it has the basics in it. It also includes Washington State's recommendations that they have in their model of ordinance, although that would have been at the time the most recent draft was um, was checked out. And actually, this says 2010, but I think 2013 is the most recent draft. So there may be some updates required, um, you know, in regards to Washington State's recommendations. But then it also includes habitat regulations that meet the biop requirements. And the reason that's important is that the biop and the RPA do have some prescriptive rules about how floodplain needs to be done, but there's a lot of requirements that have not been translated into language that we understand at the local planning, you know, level, like regulatory language, what's allowed and what's not allowed, what are the, you know, what are the requirements? And so the the door one model ordinance has taken a number of those requirements that apply to real common floodplain development activities and translated them actually into regulatory language. So then you have some rules in there that then are then black and white, you know, does it fit, does it not fit? And that really helps. The pros of this is that it's a ready-made standalone ordinance, got everything you need in it. Um, it's a pretty simple solution for communities that don't have a lot of floodplain exposure or don't anticipate a lot of development in the SFHA because of everything they need is in there. It codifies, like I said, clear limits for some of the most common types of development, which then reduces the need for habitat assessments for those activities. And this is an, an important incentive for the adoption of any level of ordinance language is that the more decisions you make, whether it's you know, um, taking the the door one model ordinances versions of of translating um, biop requirements into specific regulatory language. Those particular ones, or if you come up with more decisions, how much impervious surface are you going to allow? How you know what percentage of um, vegetation are you going to allow to be cleared? You know, if you take these requirements and make hard decisions about it, that is going to reduce the need of analysis that you need to ask from applicants because you're going to be able to evaluate right away. Does it meet, does it not meet? And, um, you know, that's going to that's going to reduce the need for habitat assessments. Um, the regulatory language in the door one model ordinance has undergone legal review, both with FEMA and regional approval from all of those stakeholders I mentioned that helped write it. Some cons for this approach is it's pretty robust. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of science in there. There's a lot of um, higher standards recommended in there, and the language may not easily fit with the existing ordinances. It's also pretty generic, right? It's it doesn't consider any unique community characteristics, plans, or challenges. It's a kind of one size fits all. So it's it's a generic approach, and it doesn't give clear limits for all development, right? As I was just talking about that habitat assessments are still going to be required for anything that doesn't fit in the box for anything for which this ordinance has not developed regulatory language. And it provides the code, but the community still needs to develop the process. You still need to figure out an application, how to train your staff on it, how to route applications, how to make sure that things aren't gonna fall through the cracks um, of your existing environmental um, regulations. So that part is still on the community. Okay, the door two approach. We call it the programmatic approach. and there's kind of a scale. There's on one end, what we're going to talk about in, is a community crosswalk, and then the other end is the progressive habitat assessment. These are all um, 
on a scale of you know this programmatic approach. So let's let's get into the community crosswalk. So community crosswalk at one end is the use of your existing regulations to show compliance. What are you already doing? Do an inventory of your existing regulations against the biop requirements and try to figure out where you've already got them covered, right? And then if there's an item missing from there, you can use the model ordinance, which is, this is also a great resource. You can look for the language in the model ordinances that fits what's missing from, from your particular, you know, combination of regulations and, and uh, adopt those. There's lots of different sources for information where you can show things that you're already doing as a community. There's the um, the marine shoreline design guidelines, uh, your shoreline permitting manual, um, and the integrated stream bank protection guidelines. There's lots of resources that if you're already using them, awesome. If you'd like to integrate them into your into your program, you can demonstrate that as you know a way that your uh, community is already meeting some of these biop requirements. There's a lot of resources out there. And then at the region, we've developed a checklist for programmatic compliance. Um, that breaks down the biop requirements and then gives you sort of a you know an easier way to do an inventory of regulations and to to tell us where you think these requirements are met and where you'll need additional um, language. I'm working right now to uh, on this this checklist to broaden it out to also include um, some tools for checking for how uh, where where. Uh, state programs like the shoreline management programs and stuff like that and the NFIP might collide so we can kind of catch those areas where things might fall through the cracks and I'm also trying to add some stuff in here that asks questions about process because that's so important as well but we are we will soon have this tool available again that sort of helps you look through your existing regulations and stitch together a crosswalk approach um, to all of this so the pros of the crosswalk approach is it allows communities to tailor a compliance strategy that takes advantage of what they're already doing, right? It's it's it molds well with existing ordinances. It contributes to permitting efficiency because, like I said, we're not looking for creating redundancies or you know or um we're making things harder. We're, we're we're actively looking for where these requirements are already being met. So then we only have to worry about what's left. And that's what this last bullet says is that you know the the more detailed those habitat re regulations are, the more you can get things to work for you um, across between the regulations for floodplain versus regulations for other environmental programs, the less need there's going to be for individual habitat assessments. The cons of this is that there really needs to be a great deal of effort um, into making sure that NFIP requirements aren't falling through the cracks and that um, both those basic permitting requirements and the biop requirements are still covered, including the protected area, which is really um, uh, idiosyncratic to, to the biop requirements. So we need to make sure that that's, that's included. What, you know, cross references, stop gaps, making sure that definitions all work together and that um, you're catching those exemptions or other elements that cannot be applied to floodplain development. And again, habitat assessments will still be needed for any types of development that are not already clearly outlined in code with some regulatory thou shall and thou shalt not kind of language in your code. Okay, so now we get to the other end of the spectrum with the programmatic approach, and that is a programmatic habitat assessment. Okay, so NIMS has told us that there is flexibility. This is what I was referencing earlier in the module when I was talking about whether or not you can mitigate uh, negative uh, effects in the protected area. Well, NIMS has told us that there is flexibility in the biop requirements, but it's only through this route. And let's look at their... Um, their language to, to break that down. So NIM says, using a landscape approach to future development, it may be possible for a jurisdiction to prescribe actions that maintain or enhance fish functions while allowing limited development in the protected area. And what's that mean? It means through, through a protected habitat assessment, a community can indicate those portions of the community where only limited habitat function remains and propose continued development in those areas in exchange for restoration activities elsewhere in the reach that will offset it. And so the, the, the idea is you look at your community and you look at where there's already existing development and where there's going to be pressure to continue developing in that area. And you say, OK, these are the limited habitat functions that are here, and this is how we will, you know, mitigate any impacts to them but we are going to continue to allow development happening here thoughtfully and to offset that so we can arrive at that net objective of not likely to adversely affect on this larger reach scale 
we're going to we have this other area of the community where there's a tremendous potential for improving and restoring habitat to be of such benefit to these species in this watershed that we still that it's okay to continue to allow development over here. And so that's kind of a it's kind of an, a, a simplified idea of it, but there's there's all kinds of places along the spectrum that are available to communities. You know, there's like that's why I think of the crosswalk to the programmatic habitat assessment as a as a scale, right? So the more the more uh, eyes you have on your community from that landscape reach, and the more um, capable you are of managing those balances of development and restoration, the wider your viewpoint can be, and the the more flexibility you have on that property by property basis. So important elements of a PHA, we need to, a community needs to analyze both current and future development trends and anticipate all the impaired habitat functions that would result from them. They need to develop a technically credible system for assessing and quantifying habitat functions and values across differing scales. So what, what are the methods of your analysis? How are you do, performing that inventory of habitat function and how are you, you know, valuing those and quantifying those as you're going about these calculations of how you can arrive at that reach scale balance, right? And any restoration that you are proposing to offset that further development in other areas needs to be consistent with a species recovery plan and it needs to be designed to benefit um, to benefit salmon at all of their life stages. So similarly to how we talked before about how um, when you are when a project proponent is assessing the impacts of a project, they have to look at all of the key habitat components. They can't leave any out, right? They can't let one thing that's super important to salmon be degraded, you know, and not not uh, mitigated because they're being so awesome at this other thing. It's similar when we're looking at these. Uh, restoration plans, it needs to benefit all life stages of salmon that would be present at that area. So it can't just benefit the babies. You got to be thinking about spawning and things for the adults as well. So it needs to be consistent with the species recovery plan and it needs to consider all the things, both habitat wise and, and salmon life stage wise. And there needs to be a detailed explanation of a long term living process to keep to make sure that permitting decisions remain consistent with the PHA. Like that, that becomes really, really important. Not only do you have this plan, but how's this plan going to be, you know, put into action? Because something like this, if you've arrived at an agreement that you are allowed to mitigate for adverse effects in your protected area when other communities are not, you it's really essential that you keep that plan that you've agreed to active and refer to it and cite it in your permitting decisions as much as possible. I will, I mean, for every decision. Um, so the pros, <coughs> excuse me, the pros of this approach is that this is the only route that NIMFS has indicated allows for the mitigation of adverse impacts in the protected area. Um, a PHE, PHA can also include offsite compensatory mitigation, if clearly outlined and consistent with a salmon recovery plan. When we're at a property by property kind of level, it's really uh, it, there's really not a way to propose offsite compensatory mitigation because you are limited to only looking at that property. So any adverse impacts, anything what else has to be balanced out in the confines of that action area, which is just that property. And so offsite compensatory mitigation, where, where it may make sense in from other regulatory perspectives, the biop really limits us to that property boundary unless we have developed this larger landscape or, or reach way of looking at things and we've arrived at a balance of development and restoration approved by FEMA and with NIMS's support, then you can start looking at offsite compensatory mitigation for those smaller, you know, for those property based impacts. And in this world of an approved programmatic habitat assessment, instead of individual habitat assessments, the only documentation that you're going to need for a project's consistency or so for a project's compliance with ESA is consistency with that plan. So every permitting decision is going to need to have some explanation of how the permitter made sure that it was consistent and compliant with that programmatic habitat assessment. And another great pro of this is that it complements other large scale planning efforts, such as the, you know, the, the state just came out with their new guidance on the comprehensive flood hazard management plan. And that has a lot of emphasis in watershed level restoration objectives, right? So if you're looking 
to um, you know to to update your CFHMP, and also there are there's funding available for the planning you know efforts to go into that. That you should you know look to the state to to learn more about that. But it, it makes a lot of sense to me that while you are working on updating that CFHMP, that is a great time to be thinking about developing this door to programmatic approach because there's a ton of overlap in there because both efforts can help a community identify from that larger scale where the development pressures are, where the restoration opportunities are, where the flood hazard issues are and how those can be offset with different development decisions and with restoration activities because we're all clear that the natural beneficial functions of floodplain translate directly into a reduction of um, damage from those flood hazards. So, so it makes a lot of sense for this to stitch into that effort into other large scale planning efforts. And it, you know, it, it really, they contribute really nicely to that more holistic large scale understanding of, um, you know, of a community's of, of balancing all of those, those uh, objectives for a community restoration, development, flood hazard, they can all work really well together. Cons of this strategy is that it requires by far the most upfront effort on, on behalf of the community. It takes a lot of analysis. It takes developing the method of that analysis. We are talking about what is your, you know, um, strategy for quantifying habitat, you know, values and quantifying development um, pressure. So it's a lot of work upfront for a community but um, and then documentation would still be required to demonstrate that all uh, development approvals and permitting decisions are consistent with the PHA. So there's a lot of pressure to keep that document alive. It can't be one of these plans that we write and that we're you know that a ton of energy and in stakeholder engagement happens until we complete it and then we stick it on a shelf. Can't be that. It's got to be something that is constantly. Um, referenced in permitting decisions that's updated, you know, with coordination with FEMA when necessary, when things shift. But this is a living document that needs to be constantly part of the daily life of, of, um, of permitters for floodplain development. It's going to require continuous staff training and interdepartment coordination because everyone who's involved in this has to be aware of this plan and has to do things um, consistently with what the community has said they're going to do. Can't sit on a shelf, just like I said. Because, and the reason all these are really important is that deviation from this programmatic habitat assessment is going to result in the communities immediately returning to door three status and to, you know, all of the requirements of that. And so that's what we're going to go into next is what life is like for a for a door three community. But um, I just really want to pitch this programmatic habitat assessment because, you know, the, the requirements of the biop for the protected area are really, really difficult for NFIP communities because, you know, as we, you know, lined out earlier, the width of the RBZ just itself can be really wide depending on the waterway. And so, you know, what it, in effect it's saying is that these shoreline, um, these shoreline buffers as being, you know, no disturbance zones, it, it's just tough. Like it, because what ends up happening is if development's continuing to happen there, regardless of the biop requirements, what we have is we just have a blind spot to those impacts because a community is not supposed to say there are no impacts, right? Through this programmatic habitat assessment approach, what we get is transparency and we get room to be honest and to look at things clearly and say, these are the impacts of development. These are what we anticipate those impacts are gonna be. This is how habitat is endangered by these decisions. And if we can be honest and clear about those and quantify those, then we know the level of restoration and the level of work we need to do to offset them. And so that then results in, you know, greater benefit to salmon. And so this is the route through which we actually can most clearly see what, you know, floodplain activity is doing and, and, and also to quantify what good things we're doing for salmon going forward. So the door three approach, the permit by permit approach, this is the approach in which the assumption is that um, that no code has been adopted or at least only very minimum code has been adopted. So this in this situation, it requires regulating to all assumptions of the biop, which means you're not allowed to take local consideration conditions into consideration when deciding how to regulate. And what I mean by that is not what I said in the earlier module about how important it is to understand the existing conditions of habitat quality and function at a site and then weighing against those. I'm talking about you're not allowed to take any larger scale um, consideration of local conditions into account. You're stuck with that property basis. Your action area is that 
property, right? That 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 you're looking at. No adverse effects in the protected area. Really, I mean, as difficult as it is, as paradoxical as it may seem, that is what the biop says that there will not be adverse effects in the protected area. Not you know, that no mitigation is allowed because there shouldn't be anything in there that requires mitigation. And NIMS gives us the following list of project types should, that should be assumed to always cause adverse effects. And if you look on this list, a few of these are real common, real familiar kinds of development that we are regularly allowing in the floodway uh, or in the in the protected area, right? So that's a, it's a tough spot to be in when we have we're not supposed to allow any adverse effects, and NIMS is clear that a lot of what we do in the floodplain in the protected area does cause adverse effects. So a door three position is a tough one to be in. Um, you must obtain and review documentation of compliance with all of the NFIP ESA requirements for each individual permit decision. So as we said before, you've got to meet that same level of compliance as communities with a door one or a door two um, ordinance, suite of ordinances. So. You have to get to the same place with fewer tools. You have to require habitat assessments from applicants, even if there's nothing in code to back you up. Um, we do recommend, though, that door two, door threes for this reason at least adopt the um, the extended development or the extended uh, definition of development that includes the removal of riparian vegetation and something in code that um, that backs you up in requiring habitat assessments because. You know, uh, without any code, you still have to require them. It's just a lot harder. Um, any kind of savvy applicant or developer is is likely to be quick to, you know, show me the law that requires this. You know, if you don't have it, it's tough. You must reject projects that do not meet the biop requirements or that provide habitat assessments that don't meet the requirements in the habitat assessment guidance. So you have to say no. You either have to send them back to be redesigned or you have to deny the permit. Um, there are... So when we talk about a habitat assessment, and I mentioned before, you know, in the in earlier module, that a habitat assessment is not a set product that you go out and buy, you know, on on the market. It's it's an idea of whatever amount of information is needed to um, to allow you to review the project for compliance with ESA. So there's different kinds of documentation. What we've been talking about so far is, you know, if you just have an applicant and they need to provide you the analysis, you can provide them the guide, say the things that the biop requires you to look at and then evaluate that report. But there are other routes and um, a real common one. Well, if there's been separate consultation under these other sections of the ESA, the, a real common one being if, if the project um, needs a permit from the Corps, from the US Army Corps of Engineers, the Corps of Engineers, they, unlike FEMA, they actually do make permitting decisions. They're issuing permits. So they have that federal action so part of their permit um, process is consultation with the services. They have direct access to the services to consult because they need to get concurrence on each one of these actions of theirs, which is the issuing of the permit. If there's an individual permit, they're going to have consultation with the services on that particular project. If it is under a nationwide uh, general permit, well, in order to put those nationwide general permits um, out or the regional general permits, consultation with the services was part of writing those permits. So that's that's already been part of that process. So um, if the project uh, qualifies for that nationwide, then you just need to have the paperwork that, that shows that in your permit file, and that can serve as your ESA documentation. Or um, if it's an individual process or an individual permit, then there's going to be an actual letter of concurrence from NIMS that this, you know, um, or from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that this project complies with ESA. And then, boom, you put that in your permit file and you're good to go. That is meeting your habitat assessment requirement. Any documentation that shows that this project was reviewed for ESA compliance and that, you know, that it uh, was approved is 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 going to work for you. If the applicant is in the process of consulting and has already written a biological assessment or biological evaluation, you're welcome to use that document and assess it um, against your requirements because that document is bound to be a pretty awesome habitat assessment because you know it's written by somebody who's aware of the ESA requirements and and um, so you're you're perfectly welcome to use that. So whatever route you go, you just need to make sure you obtain the documentation that confirms compliance. So that's permit letters, letters of concurrence or permit approvals, whatever it is, get a copy of it, put it in your permit file and you're good to go. Um, 
the pros of the door three, you know, attempt and or the com- compliance strategy. And and I know that I, I speak of it pretty negatively, and that's that's only because um, of the additional work that that, that this takes and the, the weight that it puts on local permitting shoulders, but it may be the most appropriate approach. If you're a community that doesn't see a lot of development, that doesn't have a lot of mapped um, floodplain, you know, it, it may make the most sense just to figure out how to handle this on a permit by permit basis. Um, so some of the pros are that there's no, <coughs> excuse me, no code change is required. So you don't have to crack open your ordinance and go through what can be the painful process of, you know, of adopting new language. Um, you have the same requirements for review of all permit applications. That's because you have all requirements for all permit applications. Each one has to be weighed against the buyout. But, you know, maybe there's a there's a, a, some advantage of being able to standardize that and having to do it fresh every time. You don't have the dangers of, a, you know, a plan that's getting dusty on the on the shelf that no one's trained you on. Right. Or and so if it's fresh every single time, there may be a benefit in that. Uh, the cost and effort of assessing habitat impacts is on our, uh, the, that's on applicants, not on the community. And you know that may seem kind of kind of mean, but at the same time, we have to we have to kind of return to the the basic idea of the NFIP, and that is that if someone wants to build in a flood hazard area, and if a community wants to allow them to build in that flood hazard area, then that risk needs to be on them, right? So in the same way that somebody needs to show you how they want to build a house in the flood hazard area and how they're going to meet the requirements that, you know, that will they'll make it reasonably safe from flooding, it's similar with the habitat. Like someone's got to, if someone wants to build in a area that um, where, you know, impacts could negatively affect endangered species in their critical habitat, well, then it should be on them to convince you why that should be okay, right? So, um, that cost and effort is not on the community. It's on each applicant who wants to, you know, wants to do something in the flood hazard area. Some cons of this, the first one being what I mentioned before that that makes it hardest for me is that, you know, just emotionally is that all of these compliance requirements are on the shoulders of the permitter, right? And, um, you know, that's a tough place to be. That means that you are, somebody comes in for, a, with an application or wants to do a project, you have to give them the bad news of the biop extra requirements every single time. But it might not just be across the counter at applicants and developers where there's that's a struggle. It might be for your own leadership and elected officials. If they're not aware of the requirements, you may be having a struggle to make those arguments to them, to explain to them that, that this is really important. It's hard, it's difficult, and it's expensive, but these are mandatory requirements if we're going to continue participating in the FIP. And that's a lot of pressure to put on one floodplain administrator. Habitat assessments are required for almost anything, right? Because you haven't adopted any code that has translated those requirements into strict regulatory language to make it easier for you. That means that there needs to be analysis for every project to explain um, how it's going to meet, how it's going to comply with the bio BSA requirements. And like I said before, applicants you know, are likely surprised. We we hate, you know, bad surprises at the permit encounter whenever, you know, we, we try to reduce them as much as possible. But if there's nothing in code and there hasn't been much outreach to the community about these requirements, they're going to find out at the permit encounter. And you won't have the code to reinforce you in requiring them, which is rough, you know, because then you're having to tell this whole story about the BIOP and about ESA and federal agencies and FEMA's responsibilities every single time to say why that person has to go out and do more work and spend more money and have more effort to get their permit than somebody maybe in a neighboring community that's not covered under the biop. So that's that's rough. And you've got to review every one of those applications for total biop compliance. So it's a lot of work. Um, here, this is, you know, I just want to fit in this part because um, it's an important thing to touch on. Uh, conditional letters of map revision and letters of map revision or map change. So th- those are the process through which a community is required to update FEMA with new data that would need um, amendments to the flood maps, right? So a conditional letter of map revision is is what needs to be applied when we w- if if a community knows that there's going to be a change that a proposal is is a uh, going to change the map, whether that's uh, changing the base flood elevation or the extent of the floodplain or whatever, they're required to get this conditional letter of map revision before they allow the development to happen so that FEMA can look at it and say, okay, this is how this project will change flood risk at that area, because that's essential information that the community needs to make that permitting decision. So for conditional letters of map revision, 
there is ESA compliance documentation required as part of that application. It's a national requirement, but that national standard is no take. Um, we talked a little bit about this in the habitat assessment module, but the no take standard is the that uh, listed species will not be harmed or harassed by these actions, right? So that's a little bit different standard than what we've been talking about in terms of adverse effects to, to habitat and whatnot. However, in the Puget Sound, uh, FEMA headquarters sends Clomars, whoops, sends those Clomars right back to uh, the Washington State to yours truly to review them for consistency with the BIOP higher standards. So the national standard is no take, but FEMA headquarters sends those CLOMARs back to our region to make sure that those additional higher standards regarding critical habitat and everything are met by those um, by the by those projects, those project proposals. LOMARs, on the other hand, letters of map revision, those map change um, changes that happen after a project is complete, those aren't sent to us at the region to review for those higher standards because the, the idea is that this is stuff that's already happened, right? This is development that's already occurred. And so when a community submits these app, this application, they have to first sign that community acknowledgement form. And that signature confirms that this project um, has already followed and been, been confirmed to comply with all applicable regulations. And that includes the NFIP ESA requirements. So as a community, when you sign off on that LOMAR, um, you are taking responsibility for confirming that that project's already in compliance with your uh, not only your floodplain ordinance, but any additional ESA requirements that the BIOP requires, regardless of if it's in your code or not. So that's a word about map changes that we want to make sure we get in here. So um, the communities that are in each of the doors currently, you'll see that most communities are still in this door three status, which is troubling both because of the work it must be to get this done but also it's troubling because what we talked about before in how difficult it is to capture those indirect and cumulative impacts of development if you're only looking at things from a property by property basis and you still have to meet those you still need to be considering cumulative effects but it's really really hard to do that um, with this traditional model of permit by permit We've got five communities that adopted the door one ordinance, and we've got currently 14 that have gone through the process to um, to ensure that they've got a door two level compliance based on their existing regulations. And and then we have 23 door threes that are currently applying for door two process. So we are here to help you if you want to do this work to get yourselves at a higher compliance strategy that's going to make your life easier, that's going to bake these requirements more into your program so that you can feel more confident that you're meeting them and that it's easier for you to produce the documentation that FEMA will need when we do a CAV to make sure that, that, that this, is, this is happening. We have a lot of resources that the region has developed. Um, there's a lot of CRS credit available for communities that are doing habitat protection. So check out the newest CRS handbook. Um, Engineering with nature, alternative techniques to riprap for bank stabilization, looking at how we can um, you know, adjust some of these erosion control strategies to be thinking more about salmon. There's a number of different resources that are out there. We've come up with some FAQs that are specific to real common floodplain development activities that we have as well. And um, currently our, our regional website, and at, at the time of the making of this video, you know, some of these resources aren't available, but we are, um, if you contact us, we can provide them to you. And we are working hard to make sure that there will be an online source for this information in the future. So thank you. That wraps up our talk about ordinance and compliance strategies.